What we'll do here is just give me a moment or so for the virtual room to fill up. <coughs> Excuse me. Lots of familiar names coming in. Okay. I think that's everybody, so let's make a start. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the latest in the court lecture series. Um, I'm really pleased today for January's lecture to welcome uh, Dr. Rebecca Close, who's a senior epidemiologist at the Environmental Epidemiology Group at the Radiation, Chemical and Environmental Hazards Directorate of the UK Health Security Agency. Uh, Rebecca's background is in infectious disease epidemiology and environmental epidemiology. And within her team, she leads on indoor air quality in epidemiology and has <clears throat> a dedicated interest in advancing understanding and research in the area of carbon monoxide exposure. Um, Rebecca has written and published a couple of papers recently in this area, so we're really, really delighted to have her here today to come and talk about the work that she and UKHSC are doing. Um, we are use the usual format that <clears throat> if you'd be kind enough to put any questions and queries you have in the chat facility at the bottom of the screen, and then what we'll do is we'll address them at the end of Rebecca's presentation. Um, I think that's enough for me for now. Um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. I'll just share my screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Oh, okay, hang on. Oops, didn't do it. There we go. Okay, great. Can you can you uh, see and hear me? Super. That looks good. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Adrian and Kimberly, for inviting me to talk today. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so, uh, as Adrian said, my title is a bit of a bit of a mouthful, but uh, I'm senior environmental epidemiological scientist um, in the environmental epi group at UKHSA. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, epidemiology of carbon monoxide within the UK Health Security Agency and try and give you a bit of, bit of an overview of, um, of what epidemiology is, um, who we are and, and what, what work we're doing around it. Um, so first of all, this is, um, I thought you might like to see where we're based. Um, so we're based in Didcot. We're on a, on a science park called Harwell, um, just south of Oxford. And uh, we are at the Radiation, Chemical and Environmental Hazards Directorate. Um, and this is taken on a lovely sunny day. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to first of all talk about epidemiology, what it is, and a bit about environmental epidemiology. I'm going to talk about um, carbon monoxide um, epidemiology and the work that we're doing um, within UKHSA. So we're going to have a look a bit at the research, so um, involving the hospital episode statistics, our research around the coroner's text data analysis, our health protection research unit projects. Um, I'm going to mention our environmental public health surveillance system data and, and data around CO that we can gain from that. And then other, other work um, in carbon monoxide that the UK Health Security Agency is involved in. Great. So um, first of all, I thought I'd start with defining what epidemiology is, as some people may have heard of the word, but aren't totally sure. Um, so it's sort of officially de de described as being the study of the distribution and determinants of health related states or events. And this is in specific population. 
And then it's about the application of this um, to control public health problems. So they're the three main sort of um, aims that I've highlighted really that, that are important to epidemiology. So the health related states or events in populations and to control um, health problems. And then considering environmental epidemiology, um, and this is looking at um, the health consequences of exposures that are often involuntary and occur in the general environment. And it's the application of this again to control health problems. So like we said, but within the environment um, area. So, so looking within environmental epidemiology, what are we concerned with? Um, so the three main things that we talk about often is the environmental hazards, the exposures to those hazards, and then the resulting health outcomes from those exposures to those hazards. So those are the three key things. And within that, we it's important to explore those relationships, to quantify those, you know, how much has people been exposed to and, and where, what is the relationship? And it's really important to think about the methodology that is used um, to consider, are we using the right study design? Are we using the right comparators and so on? And here's some examples here. Um, it just shows it can be, you know, anything from water quality, air quality, um, and so on. So it covers a huge area. So within the UK Health Security Agency, um, the environmental epidemiology team have three main functions. So our first function is response. So this is investigating an incident or an outbreak. So we're there ready to respond if we need to. So this could be um, responding to a large fire or a large explosion such as Bunfield. And obviously it would be those that have um, a public health significance. So those that could cause um, an exposure and then potentially um, you know, vulnerable people might be exposed and there may be some health outcomes that we may need to follow up over time. So that is an important function function of us. Outbreaks, we're talking about things, um, non-infectious disease outbreaks. So this could be, um, we, we recently had um, uh, a lot of children that were um, being diagnosed with hepatitis, but it was an unknown form of hepatitis. So it wasn't any of the, the usual um, causes of hepatitis. And um, one of the hypotheses was around um, an environmental exposure. So we um, did some work looking at um, potential environmental exposures that um, these children could have had um, in order to cause the disease. So that's an area we're involved in. Surveillance, this covers um, a non-infectious disease. So we lead on the um, lead poisoning in children. Um, we have a surveillance system for that. We also um, hold and lead on the environmental public health surveillance system, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about later on. Our third function is building um, an evidence base for advice. So research um, and research on um, epidemiology of environmental and chemical hazards. So quite a big remit, you know, it can be on, on any of those. Um, but within that, air quality, indoor air quality um, is one of those areas. And um, that's the area that, that I lead on. So just to give you uh, an overview of, of what we do. Great. OK, so let's let's sort of think about the, the burden of disease from from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and obviously, there's there's a lot of work going on in different areas with uh, many colleagues on the call and, and others um, that are all trying to kind of build up this knowledge base, build up um, research in different areas in order to get a better understanding of um, of this burden within the UK. And it's extremely important for us to, to have a good understanding around this. Um, and data and figures can help us quantify the problem. Can start to really build up that picture, identify common risk factors and look at trends over time. But it's not always an easy thing to do. Um, and there's many reasons that it's not easy. Um, as we know, symptoms of CO poisoning are um, often nondescript and it has a short half, a half life. So depending on what point you test, um, you may or you may not find it present. Also, different data sets have different challenges themselves. 
And we know that many of the figures for carbon monoxide are likely to be underestimates due to many of these um, reasons that I've just explained. So we're keen to have a look at the different data sources that are available to us and work with as many people as we can in order to start building up this better understanding. And here's a few examples of what um, we've been doing at the different levels. So at the top, we obviously have the mortality, um, which is the very tip of the iceberg. Um, and we have an agreement with the Office for National Statistics. So on an annual basis, we receive the, the annual mortality stats from them. And um, we analyze those and look at the trends over time. Um, we then wanted to be able to delve a little bit deeper into this data. And so we work with ONS um, on this coroner's text data. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but this really allowed us to gain a better understanding around those circumstances of those deaths. Going down, thinking about the, the serious injuries and the hospital admissions, um, we've worked with the Small Area Health Statistics Unit to analyze the hospital episode statistics. Um, and to look at how many, you know, how many admitted to due to unintentional non-fire related poisoning each year and looking at trends over time. At the emergency department consultation level, um, the Department of Health a few, a few years ago um, had reviewed a &E department records um, and those that used ICD-10 codes and identified those that were due to admissions to hospital I'm sorry, admissions to emergency department that were due to carbon monoxide poisoning. And they extrapolated those up to gain um, a better understanding of the sort of national figure that, that could be. Obviously, there's other work around this area, particularly from Simon, Simon Clark and others, um, exploring patients attending A&E. Um, further down, we've got GP consultations. Um, this is a tricky one, obviously due to symptoms being quite nondescript. Um, but we are hopefully um, going to, to talk to our team, our colleagues in the real time syndromic surveillance team, which are also based in the UK Health Security Agency, to try and establish if we can have a look at the, the GP consultation data set and see if we can um, do something there to, to have a look and gain a better understanding. At the bottom of the pyramid, we have poisoning with no health consultations um, and sort of community level. And this layer is even more difficult to get an accurate picture of, but several researchers have published useful data to, to help us with this. Um, and we undertook some work in Hackney, in Hackney Homes, um, looking at incidents when alarms went off um, within the community and to consider in interventions to reduce exposure. And as I mentioned, you know, we're well aware that a lot of you will be working on different, um, different parts of this pyramid, um, which is extremely important. So I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into um, some of the, the data sets and some of the, the research that we've been involved in now. Um, so first of all, I'm going to consider the, the hospital episode statistics. So as I mentioned, we worked with the Small Area Health Statistics Unit, which are based at Imperial College London, um, and we analysed um, the, the hospital episodes due to accidental non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning. And over a 10 year period, from 2001 to 2010, there were 2,463 admissions. And um, just under half uh, were um, non-fire related, so accidental and non-accidental admissions. There was seasonal um, variability, um, so higher admissions in the colder months, which is what we'd expect. Higher rates in the north of England and just over half, so 53% were male. And the highest rates of admissions were in those that were over 80 years old. And these were some published papers that we, um, we got from that data. So um, another piece of work that um, I led on was the coroner's text data analysis. So as I mentioned, we get the routine um, mortality figures from the Office for National Statistics but they will just tell us how many deaths there were in um, the, the, the year, the time period. But we wanted to really try and delve a little bit deeper and try and understand the circumstances around which people die from unintentional um, non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning. 
And we wanted to use this to, to try and inform public health interventions. So we used the ICD-9 and 10 codes, and these were from um, deaths registered between 1998 and 2019 in England and in Wales. And the circumstances that we wanted to focus on were the place of exposure, the source of carbon monoxide, and any behaviours that were associated with that exposure. So we wrote an analysis plan and um, with ONS, and they pulled out specific details from, from the coroner's text, um, from the narrative report um, around these circumstances. So the results from that study, um, between that period, so between 1998 and 2019, there were 750 deaths, of which 77% were male. 68% occurred in the autumn and the winter and the median age of death was 57. The annual number of deaths of male and female did fluctuate over time, as you can see in this chart here, but overall there was a downward, downward trend within this um, data set. Um, there was a clear trend of mortality, so increasing mortality with increasing deprivation. Um, and in England, those in the lowest occupational classification had the highest frequency of um, uh, of, of non-fire related carbon monoxide mortality. So focusing on these three areas to gain a better be understanding of the circumstances, um, first of all, when we look at place, um, so of those records that had information, so not all records, so not all of the um, coroner's narrative reports had information about these three, um, but of those that did, 59% of deaths occurred in a dwelling, and of those, 67% were male. 20% occurred in garages or outbuildings, and 12% in vehicles. So places like garages and outbuildings and vehicles are often places that people don't always think to put alarms. And of those, so those two areas, 90% were among males. So, you know, thinking about that, that's people, you know, men working out in the garages, out, out in outbuildings, maybe fixing cars with vehicles running, um, and often don't think about having um, an alarm in those. When we look at source, um, so again, of those with information, domestic pipe gas was the most common source, and that was 36%, followed by petrol and diesel with 25%. If we have a look at the reason, um, so of those with information, the most frequent uh, underlying factor was inadequate ventilation of exhaust gases. And that was 39%. And of those, 91% were male. So that is an example of, you know, possibly running a vehicle in an enclosed space and inside the garage. So deaths due to these unintentional non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning in England and Wales have decreased over time. However, fatalities still occur, especially in circum cir certain circumstances, such as in more deprived populations, in males working in garages and outbuildings, and amongst more elderly population. So prevention strategies should target not only increasing awareness of the dangers of carbon monoxide, but also the installation and maintenance of alarms, particularly in those kind of areas such as garages and outbuildings and in temporary accommodation as well, that often people don't think to put an alarm. And proper installation, regular testing um, of gas appliances is also important, as we know. And the study and being able to use this data really highlighted that it did have a valuable role. And actually that data does um, help us build um, and document the circumstances around those deaths. So from that data, we wrote a paper um, which we published and it's also been presented at several national and international conferences such as um, the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. Okay, so other areas of research. Um, so within UKHSA, we have something called our Health Protection Research Units, or HPRUs. 
we have 14 of those um, across England. And these are <laughs> research partnerships which are between a university and the UK Health Security Agency. So the units fund high quality research that aims to protect public health and minimize the health impact of emergencies. And they undertake research on predefined themes. So our team, our environmental epi team, are currently involved in a number of activities. So these are the ones that we're, we're currently involved in. Um, not gonna go into all of those because they don't all involve um, carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, but of those that do, we have two, um, two different HPRUs that do. Our first one is our indoor air and health, and that's with University of Leicester. So um, we have a PhD student and um, we've done some research looking at indoor carbon monoxide measurement error. And we've written a report um, on that, which will hopefully be published shortly. The PhD student um, has done a study looking at indoor air and VOCs, and um, we were able to include CO here as well. So um, she used indoor air monitors, and we also used the Lascar carbon monoxide monitors as well. Um, and these were placed in all homes. We had um, about three monitors in each home um, in different locations within the house, um, in rooms that had um, a fuel burning appliance and uh, or, or gas uh, boiler, for example. And they were in homes with um, of asthmatic patients. So they were left for a few weeks to measure the level of carbon monoxide and then the results were analysed. We have another study um, looking at indoor environmental exposures and health, and this is with Imperial College London. Um, we've undertaken a rapid research, sorry, literature review of carbon monoxide exposure models, and this is between 2010 and 2023. And the aim of this is to characterize exposure in household dwellings um, and assessing the health impacts of those. So a paper is currently being um, and written around that. We were also lucky enough to be involved in the Well Home Study, um, which is part of this HPRU. And this measures indoor air quality in households of asthmatics in West London. Um, so again, we've used our Lascar CA monitors and we've put those in, in homes. So similarly, they're in, in rooms with, with fuel burning appliances um, and left for uh, quite a few weeks and um, levels of carbon monoxide are measured at one minute intervals over that time period. And we can have a look and, and compare levels within, within the house, compare houses and so on. And obviously we have house uh, characteristic data for that too. <coughs> So next, I'm um, going to talk about our environmental public health surveillance system. Um, so within UKHSA, we um, have this surveillance system um, for environmental events, hazards and chemical incidents. So it provides essential information um, required for health risk assessment to take place. EPHSS collects data on indoor air quality events, as well as outdoor as well, and other environmental exposures, um, but we were look, particularly looking at the indoor air quality events here. So it's a passive surveillance system and um, uh, it's currently for UKHSA employees only and only hosts UKHSA data. However, the long-term plan is to open that up for other colleagues to use and um, to input into and to use as well. So we get daily imports into the surveillance system and we hold data um, since 2015 and they're stored as individual data. So we know exactly where they are and we can look at those individual incidents. Um, so we recently analysed uh, this data, looking at indoor air quality events. And uh, so it's for England and we looked at the data between the 1st of January, 2015 and the end of April, um, 2023. So between that time period, we had 868 events that involved indoor air pollutants. 
and carbon monoxide, chlorine and mercury were the most common indoor air pollutants involved in these events. And um, 237 events involved chemicals that are listed in the WHO and UK HSA guidelines for indoor air pollutants. So these are air pollutants that actually have guideline values for how much um, you, know, you should be exposed to. Many of the others don't and will be much more, um, you know, you much less likely to see those. So we looked at these that did. And of these, 209 or 88% were carbon monoxide events. And the majority of these carbon monoxide incidents occurred in accommodation type settings. Um, they followed seasonal trends, so more occurred in winter months, as again, as we uh, have found elsewhere. And um, overall, we found that indoor air quality events were on a gradual decline until 2022, when there was a sharp increase, probably due to COVID related factors. Um, so this data is regularly analysed by our colleagues in our environmental hazards and emergency team. And this is the team that collects the actual data. So um, they're the one, they're the team on the ground that get the calls um, about these incidents and will give the public health advice about that. So they collect the data and the data then comes into our surveillance system. Um, and uh, this, this piece of work here was um, undertaken by our colleagues in the environmental hazards and emergency team. Um, and myself, and we were just looking at unusual incidents of carbon monoxide exposure. Um, so I was just picking out something here, um, and an unusual one that they found was an indoor um, indoor sparklers inside a nightclub, and these emitted carbon monoxide as they cooled down, which caused acute symptoms and several casualties. These casualties were treated by ambulance staff. Um, and the data was used to raise awareness and prevent similar incidents occurring in the future. So it's really important to look at those unusual events as well as analyze you know, what, what's happening over time and have a look at that. So um, we also have lots of other papers that we've published over time. Here's just a few examples. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had a case study in Hackney Homes um, looking at the detection and interventions to reduce population exposure. Um, Giovanni Leonardi, um, he heads up the environmental epidemiology team, and he's worked um, over the years with, with Simon Clark, with Bob Flanagan and others, and published um, uh, loads of papers, not just with them, but with others too, um, on many different areas regarding um, carbon monoxide and uh, epidemiology. He's also recent, ha, recently had a PhD student <clears throat> and um, she's been looking at um, can exhaled carbon monoxide be used as a marker of exposure? So herself and Giovanni have published several papers there as well. And obviously there's many other examples, just picked out a few here. OK, so I'm going to move on to think about the other work within the UK Health um, Security Agency. So not the research work that we do, um, but this is uh, uh, our colleagues in the air quality public health team. And so this is um, Sani Dimitropoulou and Sierra Clark who work on this. So um, thanks to them for providing me with a few slides. So um, they work uh, on the cross government group and um, because no government or department or agency lead on this issue, um, lots of different departments and agencies are involved in this. So they've brought together this cross government group on gas safety and carbon monoxide um, and uh, in order to join up the work to make a difference. So the work that they do is around developing effective government strategies, promoting knowledge and understanding and managing um, gas safety and risks. So every year, the um, cross-government group publishes a report to explain the collective work the government has been doing um, to improve gas safety and tackle the risks um, around it from, from all fuels. And it covers actions to raise carbon monoxide awareness, initiatives to support professionals, legislation, research and parliamentary activities. And here's just an example of the 
the annual table that's in there with the figures. So another way that the UK HSA supports professionals is through the National Poisons Information Service. And this provides expert advice to healthcare professionals on acute and chronic poisoning to carbon monoxide, but also to loads of other um, poisons as well. And NPIS um, publishes an annual report providing information on epidemiology and CO poisoning and the sources of exposure. And here's again, here's the table from, from that report. Public awareness is obviously a really important uh, area that we cover. Um, it's great if we're doing the research, but actually we need to make sure that we get these messages across um, and raise awareness as well. So the UK Health Security Agency um, develops and puts out educational materials. Uh, we put together public awareness campaigns. Um, for example, we've written many blogs and uh, created information videos such as this one that uh, Izzy was in a few years ago. We also put messages out um, via social media campaigns um, and during Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week each year, we work closely with the all-party parliamentary group on carbon monoxide to make sure that our messages are closely aligned to their messages across, across the week. And we also feed into other things as well, such as um, the adverse weather and health plans um, that come out uh, you know, during cold weather snaps and uh, well, also and, and warm weathers as well. Um, and we make sure our messages get our messages around carbon monoxide into those. Then there's regulations. So um, the carbon monoxide alarm regulations were updated in 2022 and these apply to England. And the information um, shared in the cross uh, party parliamentary group had uh, sorry the cross government group had a part to play in those in those revisions then there's the um, guidance for midwives and maternity staff to invent uh, to identify environmental carbon monoxide poisoning so in in 2014 public health england as we were then obviously we've recently changed our name um, to changed agencies into uk health security agency but back in 2014, um, Public Health England published guidance in the form of an algorithm to help midwives identify pregnant women who were potentially exposed to carbon monoxide from sources other than tobacco smoking during routine antenatal checks and to provide appropriate advice. So this involves conducting an exhaled carbon monoxide test, breath test, um, which was already routine um, to identify women who smoke. So this is checking exhaled carbon monoxide levels against specific thresholds and then asking follow up questions which may help raise suspicion of sources in the home, workplace or elsewhere. And the air quality and public health team in UK HSA have been working with stakeholders um, with expertise in midwifery, pregnancy, indoor air quality and tobacco control to review, to revise and update these antenatal, antenatal check algorithms and um, with a newly funded award from from court the uk health security agency along with other project partners will pilot test and improve the revised algorithm in selected maternity services across england and uh, and other local insights so that's great news so thanks very much for that that funding to be able to do that piece of work Okay, so that was just a uh, whistle stop tour, really. Um, and hopefully I've provided a bit of an insight into the carbon monoxide epidemiology work that the UK Health Security Agency is involved in. Um, and hopefully I've sort of been highlighted the importance of epidemiology um, and giving you a bit of a flavour of the sort of official statistics that we use, um, some of the research studies that we're involved in, um, the surveillance data that we hold and that we can analyse, given um, an overview of the guidance, our sort of public health awareness campaigns, the regulations that get updated, the reports that we write, and then um, the peer-reviewed publications that um, we've recently um, published too. And we are extremely keen to, passionate about continuing our work here 
with different data sets and with, with as many co colleagues as we can in order to continue building up that knowledge around the burden of disease associated with carbon monoxide poisoning. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Um, so I presented today on, on behalf of um, the team as well. So, so this is my personal address and this is the, the team inbox. So if you have any questions, um, please contact me. And also to acknowledge um, Sunny and, and Sierra in the air quality public health team too, who um, do some very important work um, in, in around carbon monoxide poisoning as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really, really great. Um, I was aware of some of the work that's going on, but, you know, it's very impressive that the sheer volume and all the different areas that it that it, that it covers. Um, if anybody has any questions for Rebecca, if you want to put them in the chat, I see we've got a couple in there already. Um, but as I'm chairing this event, it means I have the conch, so I get to go first. Um, first of all, thank you for mentioning the work that's going on to um, revise the 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 um, the the algorithm for um, uh, for maternity services. I think it's a really really important piece of work, and it dovetails nicely with other work that's going on in that area. There's the the the, um, the training modules for healthcare professionals, with the module that focuses in on um, on, on pregnancy. Um, there's the, the the prevalence study that's going on and all the other behavioural work. So it's a really nice addition to that. When we have our conference in the summer, um, that will be one of the themes we'll be looking at maternity services and hopefully the algorithm will be further down the road then. So there may be an opportunity for people to come and, 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 and talk about you know, where you've got to with that and how we can all input into making sure that that's right. Um, <clears throat> Um, the, the the other thing I was going to mention was the you you talked about the various papers and I don't know Giovanni's been publishing papers on CO for a long long time but <clears throat> are the the pa you know, is it, is it the papers that are related to the work that UKHSA has done are, is are they available somewhere in one place people want to go and have a look at those when well, I suppose you've got to go and search by author rather than, than yeah. in that, one place it's a very good question um and I, I mean we we have all the papers that that we've worked on and published yeah on live so if you are interested i think specific we can help but actually that's a very good point it would be really nice to have all of our papers um in one place we're currently revising our website um and so we are hoping to well our team has recently expanded which is great which means we have more resources um to <clears> focus <throat> areas including carbon monoxide but we are currently revising our website so we're going to have a page okay. for carbon monoxide as well as all of the other areas that we cover um yeah. and within that we will make sure we put all of the publications on there so yeah. we will show you is the answer but we don't currently so no if you no can, no that would be, be super because you know it's a, a real achievement really when you look at the breadth of the work that's been done and um you know you, you guys are one of the leaders in this area so I think it'd be something that should be, you know, you should shout about from the rooftops, really. Um, and you've sort of preempted what I was going to say when we spoke about doing this lecture. You mentioned that your team is growing and expanding. Um, so I was going to put you on the spot and ask you what your sort of future plans are and what comes next. I mean, you're doing so much, but you're obviously going to continue. This is one of the areas that you're going to continue to look at. And when you see numbers like 88.2% of those incidents being CO incidents, it's obviously something that, you know, um, isn't going away even if we do move towards hydrogen and how long that might take and pure you know, heat pumps you know even at low levels we know that there's an incident yeah. so what's next for UKHSA? Well that's a very good question um, thank <laughs> you so um, yeah as, as I mentioned we've we've historically been quite a small team within environmental epidemiology so so generally it's been um, myself leading on on the carbon monoxide and indoor air quality work and Giovanni obviously who heads up the the team um, and he's obviously got a passion for carbon monoxide and worked on it for many years um, but we have um, over this last year recruited quite a few new new members of staff which is great some some more junior kind of scientists 
And um, so, so in fact, one of the, the first areas of work that I got one of our new scientists to do was to analyze that environmental public health data for indoor air quality, in particular in relation to carbon monoxide. So that report I'm just um, editing at the moment and we will be publishing shortly. But I was really keen. That's a data set that we've got there that we've never looked at uh, in, you know, over time to have a look at the the incidence of, of carbon monoxide. So I was really keen to be able to use that as we have it on tap. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously we'll continue our HPRU work um, and all the other areas too, but um, we'd like to, to pick up some new areas as well. So um, definitely working with the real-time syndromic surveillance unit will be um, one of our priorities. So have a look at, having a look at the data sets that they hold and seeing if we can potentially um, work with them to 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 ha have a look at you know things like the gp consultations and emergency departments and yeah. see if we can delve in deeper it's really difficult but to try and make tracks with that so that's definitely an area but as i say we're open to working with others and other ideas too so um you know yeah. please feel free to contact us if anyone has any further ideas yeah i think the the, the getting into the gps is really hard isn't it um uh you know with something that we've always really struggled with um and um, you know we we supported the work that uh mpis have been doing through the top space um system over the last few years and one of the things that we talked about was the i'm going to call it the 111 number because i can't remember what it's called now because it's changed its name hasn't it it's something else now but you know that 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 first tier that people are encouraged to contact rather than going to the gp i wondered whether that was an opportunity that you know you'd be able to access data because I wonder how many people, you know, contact one 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 with those sort of nebulous, non-specific, you know, symptoms that that can often be mistaken for other things, and whether there's, you know, there's a, there's a piece of work from your perspective that you might be able to shine some light on. Um, yeah, definitely. And again, that's another data set that the real time syndromic surveillance hold as well. Um, yeah. So I think it will be working with them and across those data sets to see what we can we can really kind of delve into and, and get. Yeah. But as you say, it's really tricky um, with the sort of nondescript um, symptoms and things to to do. But we will certainly try. That is our aim. Yeah, I'm quite conscious that I'm hogging all the time here, but I've got two quick ones really. PhD up in Leicester. Um, how much longer is to run on that? Is that completed or is that an ongoing thing? So the data has been collected and she will be writing up. So um, okay. hopefully within the next year, we should get some publications. Okay, super. Um, I'd quite like to sort of perhaps have a chat really, you know, see where there are synergies and if there's anybody that we're working with that we could introduce with that could be be useful. So that, that, that would be good. Um, okay. And the PhD student working with Giovanni, who's had a number of patient papers out, are they done? Are they a, a doctor now? Or... Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, so she was from Taiwan and she's published a number of papers and she's yeah. a, a practicing public health consultant. Okay. Taiwan, yeah, it's, it's it, yeah. I know you, when you look at the literature, there's a lot of work going on in Taiwan, isn't there? On CEO, it seems to be an area where there are a couple of, you know, researchers taking a lot of interest um the, the final thing i was going to ask it suddenly sprung to mind when you mentioned giovanni was way back before covid um we we did quite a bit of work talking to the guys at the uh at the ihme you know the, the global burden of disease um and i attended a couple of different conferences and there was the uh infet the to the international public health and environmental travel tracking guys you know, with Paolo and others. Um, yeah. I just wondered, are they still going? Are yeah. they active? You know, are they still doing stuff on CO? Because, um, you know, I've been at things over the last year or two um, where the, the, we talk about the CDC, uh, public health tracking and environmental tracking. And I just wondered what was going on from a European perspective and whether we're still you know, involved in collecting data in that way, because it's quite interesting to get that you know that that perspective there was the the paper in the lancet came out in the autumn from the um from the gvd people yeah. so i just wondered you know what's going on with those guys 
Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. So INFET, which is the International um, Public Health Tracking um, Network, is definitely um, still going in good force, which is great. Um, so uh, we have we now have Ariana Zika who's working with us. So she's um, also joined um, INFET from from um, UKHSA side of things. Um, yeah. They are meeting. That I think that it's there's one coming up. So in fact, it's a very good time to ask that question. So I will put that I will get that put on the agenda and um, we can certainly ask around. I, you know, I'm not sure when they last met. So I'll certainly ask that question and I can get back to you with a, a, an international update. Because as you said, yeah. over the years we've worked quite closely with CDC and um, also our colleagues in France and Italy and so on. Netherlands yeah. are really useful to compare things. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I will get an update from that and I can... Um, update you Adrian yeah no that'd be super because because you know I think you know uh, as we know the CO doesn't recognize you know <laughs> nation states or borders so it's really really important that we are joined up you know yeah. we the things that we are funding we want to make sure that anybody who can make use of them has access to them so we're always looking for those opportunities to collaborate and, and, and share information and learn because you know Although we do a lot here in the UK, you know, we can always learn from, from other countries. I certainly went to the National CO Awareness Alliance conference in North Carolina in the summer and, you know, was absolutely blown away by some of the information and some of the things that they're doing there. So, you know, I think it's very, very important. Anyway, enough from me. I should shush now and let other people have the opportunity. Um, people are asking whether we could share the slides and the 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 graphic the poster that you had on unusual co incidents would that yeah. be okay if we shared them as a pdf when we send yeah. things out afterwards yeah that's fine shall i um pdf those and send those to you please if you wouldn't mind yeah. um we've had a question are there other risk mitigation strategies for co in workplaces such as offices apart from ventilation and co sensor monitoring mm. <laughs> You might be better placed to answer. That. I was going to say that's quite a, 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 a sort of technical um, question. I mean, you know, I think I think it, it is things. You know, the the basics that we always say, isn't it? Ensuring that the, you know potential sources of CO are correctly maintained, correctly installed, operated in the right way according to manufacturer's instruction. You know, be careful using generators or uh, carbon fuel based appliances in the doors don't do that you know it's common sense really I suppose and in terms of heating appliances making sure that they're correctly installed and correctly used and then ventilation is a part of that and then the monitoring is you know sensors and alarms as a second line of defense for when those things fail I guess I think um the next question is you, you've given very valuable examples of work being undertaken across England do you have visibility or knowledge of what's happening elsewhere in the UK ensure joined up sharing of data so you you collect across the uk don't you? i mean you are the uk hsa but so it, it, it's a tricky one we are called uk hsa we used to be public health england um so we 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 do and we don't so um so scotland ireland northern ireland um will are, are separate so then they're, they're not generally involved within UKHSA. Um, yeah. but we, but Wales, we mostly are. And it depends on what data sets they are and it depends on um various things. But so for, for a lot of the work that we've been involved in, we are doing um England and Wales. So um Scotland and Ireland, both Northern and Southern Ireland, tend to um do things separately. So again, we do have our links there. Um, so we are trying to form sort of stronger links with our colleagues there um, in order to do a more joined up approach. But at the moment, a lot of our work is mostly England and Wales, which is, Great. I know, very confusing as we are UK HSA. Yeah. It's always confusing when we get to these things, isn't it? Yeah. You never quite you know what you expect. Um, we've had a request for the WHO guidelines for uh, indoor air and CO to be shared. Um, we can certainly do that, can't we? If we 
we'll circulate that with the the, the, um, the link to the presentation and the other papers. Um, Jennifer's asked, uh, how did these events cut the, when you talked about the uh, analysis of the various events, yeah. how did the events come to be included in the analysis? Um, how were they reported to you and who deemed it an event? So where did that data come from? Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, our colleagues in the environmental hazards and emergency teams um, are the sort of first port of call. So if there's an incident that is um, of public health significance that um, they may need advice or guidance on, then it could be the public or it could be um, a local authority or another health professional can call our um, environmental hazards and emergency team to get advice. So any calls will be logged on their database. And this is the data set that goes into, into our surveillance system. Okay. So um, the, the details of the incident will be recorded and the details of any public health advice or interventions given will also be recorded. So we have that, that information as well. So, so it won't be all, you know, it's not going to capture all carbon monoxide events, but it will capture some that are big enough for public health um, advice or intervention. Okay. So, you know, the study that NPIS did over seven or eight years where when they had a query from a healthcare professional to the top space line, there was a follow up. In theory, is that something that could be done with that? You know, do you think that we could do a, that there potentially could be a sort of piece of research where those calls are followed up to get more information about the incidents? Or uh, is what you get when they the log the call, is it pretty comprehensive? Um, so they log a call, and um, but and we can certainly have a look because some of those will um, they will update the system. So so if they log initial call and then they need some kind of public health advice or intervention, they can go back in and then they can put details of what's happened or any updates and things. So we can certainly have a look at those. Mm. Um, so we could certainly do something along those lines of of, of that of the work that that paper did. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it may or may not uh, be as detailed and, and and show show anything of significance, but we could certainly try. Yeah, no, so I was just curious, really. Um, okay, Dr. Robert Dickinson from Imperial College. Um, uh, did you say there's been an increase in indoor CO incidents in 2022? With COVID-19, one might have thought the awareness of the need for good ventilation would have increased. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so we, yeah, so sorry, I said there was a, a gradual decline until 2022, and then there was a sharp increase. So this is of, so this is of these incidents that we're just talking about that get reported to us to our environmental hazards and emergency teams. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess um, it's tricky to say, isn't it? And obviously, you would yeah. have expected an increase during COVID because more people were spending um, more time indoors in their homes and. Um, uh, so you sort of expect that. However, you know, thinking about the, the timing, obviously 2022, we were just starting the sort of um, uh, oh, the, the, what do we call it? The the fuel crisis and the, um, you know, when the cost of fuel yeah. rocketed, wasn't it? So whether yeah. people are starting to um, burn more things that uh, they shouldn't have. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, so there's possible explanations there, aren't there? Around it's that, that you know, um, heat in one room and things like that, yeah. isn't it? Where, yeah, okay, yeah, and well, it's quite quite interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that data yeah how that pans out over time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Daniel Hopkins asks: um, Are there any specific factors that could be identified in the study period that accounts for the reduction in CO poisoning incidents? For example, upgrades from open flue boilers, you know, to room sealed devices or education initiatives. Um, I know when you look at the gas industry data, you can sort of track the decline. You can see where uh, they moved from uh, town gas to uh, North Sea gas, the introduction of the gas safe register or Corgi as it was then, and then the, the boiler scrappage scheme. And, you know, you can sort of see that decline. I mean, do you see anything in particular that you can marry up with the, the data that you've seen? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, and 
nothing obvious that that we have been able to plot um but i guess we've been more looking at the trends over time and the mm -hmm. the data side of things than, than plotting those but that would be a really interesting thing to overlay and do yeah um, i do agree really drilling yeah. down to the reasons why it is declining yeah i might be quite an interesting sort of question to pose um yeah, there were things like the boiler scrappage scheme. It wasn't called that, but that's what everyone called it, uh, which was for environmental reasons, but it had this, you know, secondary safety um, aspect. So, yeah, it might be good to, you know, have a look at that. Perhaps we could go to some of the industry bodies that we work with with that slide and, and ask them to perhaps have a discussion at one of their meetings and then feedback. That would be, um, that'd be really useful. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm quite conscious of time, so apologies if we don't get to the questions. Um, Tony asks, very good presentation. As a member of the RVAI, the Residential Ventilation Association, I'm very interested in car, how carbon monoxide deaths have dropped over recent years. As houses become more airtight and fuel poverty is on the rise, which I just mentioned, people seem to be using alternative heating systems. Do you think this will lead to an increase in domestic deaths and illnesses? Mm. That's kind of what we were saying, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, actually, yes, isn't it? If people are burning different things that they shouldn't be, and obviously ventilation's a lot tighter, then um, then it, it, you know, we might see that trend go up again. Yeah, Carry on. yeah, um, right. <clears throat> of the data and having a look, having the the data over a long period of time is that we can see those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Daniel Hopkins asks, um, the increased amount of males, the, the larger number of males that suffer from CO incidents, do you think this can be attributed to biological factors in addition to activity? Do you want to beat your neck out? Man? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I, I, I could comment on that. I no. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it, is it? Is it? I don't know. No, yeah, let's not get into that, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but that is an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, something to, to look at, perhaps some of the circumstances, you know, to see, yeah. you know, the locations and the activities and things. Um, but certainly one that would be interesting to tease out. Um, Sharon asks about um, sharing the slide deck, which we said we would do. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just going to scroll down. Um, We've asked fast and asked fast for Um, Okay, Galen from the APPG of carbon monoxide. Very insightful and useful presentation. Thank you. How do UKHSA's local health protection teams work with frontline services? Um, both health workers, such as community nurses and GPs, and others like fire services on CO prevention and response. For example, do teams take referrals from frontline workers of CO incidents? Or do they proactively support prevention? So I would say they do a bit of both. Um, there is a lot of uh, reactive work. So they do take a lot of calls from um, frontline workers, from, um, you know, uh, local authorities, from um, all sorts of agencies and authorities. So there's a lot of um, proactive work. Um, they will also do some prevention as well. However, um, you know, they have been, they are all quite stretched with um, covering a vast area. So I would say, um, you know, it's probably more proactive than um, reactive. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Dan Edwards from SGN, one of the gas distribution networks, um, he's commented that. Uh, they saw a sharp increase in unsafe heating practices being used when the energy crisis kicks off. So that kind of rhymes with what we were saying. Um, Tony has another question. He's asking whether domestic illnesses and deaths, uh, is there any data on if the dwellings comply to Part F ventilation compliance? No, unfortunately, we don't have that data. No, no. I think a lot of the data is, you know, you're lucky if you get what sort of housing type it is, and you know, but then sort of tenure, it's quite patchy, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it is yeah. tricky, and I don't know whether people would necessarily know that either. No, no. Um, okay, Jennifer has another comment. 
Um, the majority of recent deaths that they are aware of, she uh, works with the um, campaigning charity CO Gas Safety, are related to petrol and diesel. And she suspects that this is to do with the lack of awareness that these be carbon fuels. And I think probably you'd agree with me that there, there is there is a piece of work to be done because people think of carbon monoxide and largely still think it's associated with pipe natural gas and aren't aware that you know those generators and um, power tools that are that are petrol driven you know have have you know, a, yeah. a CO risk. Um, they're often sorry, the, that you don't have um, CO alarms as well, isn't it? When you're using yeah. you know, those in enclosed spaces, so that's no. why high proportion of deaths are due to those yeah yeah okay it's three o'clock we've got one last question um and this is from sharon who is president of the national co awareness alliance in the us the us is also experiencing an increase in poisoning considering the number of poisons that go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed is there any evidence of improvement in diagnostics or emergency response recognition Well, I'm not sure I'm able to answer that one. <laughs> Shall I? I mean, this has been one of the things that, you know, we focused on when we've come to look at research to improve how we diagnose and detect, because, you know, you, you can only count if you have the tools to recognise all the incidents. And um, I think there is, you know, You've got to have the techniques, you've got to have the, the biomarkers and the technology, and you've also got to have the education and awareness. And it's a sort of two-pronged thing. And I think that I think that there is some work to be done here. And I think it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing and uphill struggle. I think that um I think that we're starting to see those wheels turn. And certainly there's a lot of work that we're funding that hopefully will help. Um, but it, you know. I think the policies and, uh, and 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 the law and the regulations and the guidance won't change until the evidence is there. So, and there's a bit to do, isn't there? Um, and I think we are at three o'clock, so we're out of time now. Um, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you, Rebecca, for presenting today. We really appreciate it. It's been a great presentation and really, really interesting. Um, if you have any other questions, please do email um, Kimberly or I, and we can share them with Rebecca and get back to you. Um, so I hope everybody has a great afternoon, and thanks again for, for presenting and for attending today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye.